the Cambridges hit the arcade. Princess Beatrice turns 32, and journalist Omid Scobie joins us to break down his new bombshell book about Harry and Meghan. This is a major moment in royal history. We will be looking back at this for some time. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Report, everyone. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter, and it's been another busy week for the Royal Family, so let's get right to the news. Last week, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip arrived in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, to kick off their annual summer retreat at Balmoral Castle. And as always, it will be a working vacation for the Queen, who will continue to receive her daily government briefings. Also last week, Kate traveled to Sheffield to pay a special visit to Baby Basics, a charity that acts as a food bank for baby supplies such as diapers, wipes and books for families in need in the UK. During the outing, the Duchess sported a face mask by one of her favorite brands, Amaya, while chatting with parents about the invaluable support Baby Basics provides. Last Wednesday, William and Kate made a surprise appearance at an arcade on Barry Island, a popular summer resort spot in Wales. While there, the couple enjoyed some classic games and even gave us a rare public display of affection as they tried their hands at a claw machine. Unfortunately, they walked away empty-handed, but the game bridges weren't done just yet. Oh no, William and Kate continued their day in Wales with a visit to the Shire Hall care home in Cardiff. If that location sounds familiar, it's because the royal couple actually called a virtual bingo game for the residents back in May. During Wednesday's outing, the Duke and Duchess both donned face masks by Amaya while speaking with staff and residents about how they've adapted to keep everyone safe during the COVID-19 crisis. Also last Wednesday, Meghan won a legal battle in her ongoing case against Associated Newspapers and the Mail on Sunday to protect the anonymity of five of her friends who spoke to People magazine for a cover story in February 2019. The High Court judge stressed that the ruling was an interim decision and that it could change if one or more of the friends gives evidence at a future trial. That same day, the Queen sent a heartfelt message to the president of Lebanon in the wake of Tuesday's devastating explosion in Beirut that killed over 150 people. Her Majesty expressed that she and Prince Philip were deeply saddened by the news and that their thoughts and prayers are with all those who have been affected. On Saturday, Beatrice turned 32 years old. Of course, everyone here at the Royal Report would like to wish the princess a belated happy birthday. On Monday, online social justice organization Color of Change shared footage from a conversation between their president, Rashad Robinson, and Prince Harry. During the discussion, the Duke spoke candidly with Robinson about the issue of racial injustice and the need to shift from analysis into action. Here's a look. So we have to go to the, to the root of the problem, to the source of the problem, and actually fix it there. And as we've discussed before, it's gonna take every single one of us. This is not down to the black community. This is down to every single person that is on the planet right now. And finally, the highly anticipated new book, Finding Freedom, Harry and Meghan and the Making of a Modern Royal Family was released on Tuesday, which brings us to today's guest, the co-author of Finding Freedom, Omid Scobie is here. Omid, it's so great to have you here. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been a wild ride this week, but I'm excited to have the book finally out there. I bet, I bet you are now, as I just mentioned, and you do too. You've written a new book alongside fellow Royals journalist, Carolyn Durand, which promises to go beyond the headlines and reveal the true story of Harry and Meghan, from their romantic first date to their shocking decision to step back from their royal duties to the beginning of their new life in LA. Now, I think it's fair to say this is the most in-depth account of the Sussexes' life we've ever seen, thanks to your extensive interviews with those closest to the couple. But Omer, before we dive into the book, I want to talk a little bit about you. You, of sure. course, are a widely respected royals reporter, having covered the royal family since William and Kate's wedding back in 2011. So I'm curious, how did you get started on the royals beat and why was this something you wanted to do? Well, it's interesting. I actually had no prior interest in the royal family until William and Kate got engaged. And I was actually working for an American out news organization at the time. And I realized that we needed a relationship with the palace. And 
obviously figured out a way to get in there and I started traveling with the couple and getting to know William and Kate through all of their engagements and obviously as royal correspondents you really get a front row seat into that world and it's quite addictive I must say I always used to question why some people do it for so long but I think that access really keeps you in there and one of the reasons why I would waited so long to do a royal, royal biography up until now was because I felt that I wanted to be able to offer a unique angle to a story. And with Harry and Meghan's story, we obviously saw it covered so intensely in some of the British tabloids. But I felt that time and time again, there was really a different narrative emerging out of that that didn't match up with what I was seeing in front of me or what the sources I had knew of Harry and Meghan themselves. Wow. Well, as you just mentioned, just getting to know the royals and, and traveling with them has been an incredible experience. Going on all the royal tours. What's it like going on those trips? Can you describe that for us? I would liken it to going on a school trip. It's very, you're all sort of packed in on the same transport, <laughs> sometimes sharing the same planes or buses as members of the royal family and it's sort of a very dizzy itinerary that will take you from very early morning from one country to the next usually covering dozens of engagements in just a few days time but it's probably the best way to establish yourself on the royal beat and it's also the best way to get to know members of the royal family uh, in the past we've been lucky enough to have sort of social receptions and even drinks with members of the royal family and it's how i really first got to know harry actually i had some great conversations with him over the years and it really helped me understand who he is and what he was about and one of my favorite things about Harry was going to sort of remote parts of the world where people didn't really know who he was that I always felt was when he was at his best and really when we look back it tells us so much about his relationship with his role within the institution of the monarchy and now we see him thriving outside of that and I can't help but think that this would have happened no matter who he would have married or what path he would have been on. How was he different when people didn't recognize him? I think he's just a lot more laid back. I think he likes it when there's less press around. He certainly gets, I would say, a little worked up sometimes when there is that sort of constant throng of camera shutters going off in the middle of a royal engagement. I know that he quite likes it to be about just that moment there. He likes to put other people before himself. And I remember speaking with an aide that worked closely with him and said that sometimes putting together press releases with him was tough because Harry would always say, put the other people's names before mine because I'm really not the story here. Those guys are the heroes or those are the people we should be speaking about. And that was always something I think that made him stand apart from other members of the royal family. Wow, very insightful. Now, can you tell us about the first time you met Megan? What was your initial impression of her? Well, having a background in entertainment news, I actually met Megan for the first time at a Toronto Fashion Week event oh. in 2015. And it was a very brief encounter. And obviously at the time we all knew her as a, as a breakout star of Suits. So I think my one takeaway was that she was a woman of depth. Uh, she obviously was very engaged in her philanthropic work as well as the acting career that she'd been so successful in. And so when those first rumors or that report came out that Harry was dating Meghan Markle, I think when some people were scratching their heads, I, the first thing I thought was, well, I can kind of see how that would work because they both sort of have their hearts in a very similar place. And ultimately that's the thing that's really sort of driven their relationship. They love to work together and they really have grand plans for sort of helping the world. Indeed. Now, I think everyone will agree Harry and Meghan have had a rather difficult relationship with the press, to say the least. Present company excluded, of course. But as a member of the press who's watched that difficult relationship unfold, why do you think it's been that way? Well, it's been interesting for me. My career has really pretty much just been in the US media. And so I've been able to stand almost on the side and observe that sort of British media approach to the royal family. There's almost I would say an unhealthy relationship there at times where there's a feeling of ownership over members of the royal family. They're held to an incredibly high standard and that makes it very difficult for newcomers. It's why Meghan would have found it such a culture shock working in the House of Windsor. And I think for Harry, listen, he's always been very aware of how much that relationship with the media affected the life of his mother. And I think he blamed many sections of the media for the death of his mother. And it's something that he's really fought within himself to really deal with because of course his work does involve the media every step of the way much as he tries to sort of break away from that. 
one of the interesting struggles between their time as working royals is that they really wanted to diversify that pool of media they worked with. They wanted to bring in foreign correspondents. They wanted to work with grassroots media organizations and spread their message a little further. I think they really understood that they had such global appeal. And one of the things that was reported back to them at the palace was, well, if you want to do it that way, you're going to have to start funding your engagements yourself. And I think that's really where one of the early seeds was planted in Harry and Meghan's ideas about potentially changing their working model. And so I wasn't that surprised when they made that very clear in January when they put that Sussex Royal website out that they did want to break away from the British Royal Rotor and do things a bit differently. Yeah. Now, you, of course, have an excellent relationship with Harry and Meghan. And I understand not only were you one of the reporters inside Buckingham Palace for Meghan's final royal engagement, but that she actually gave you a heartfelt hug goodbye when hugs were allowed. Uh, please tell us about that day and, and just how emotional a moment was that? Well, yeah, I was one of three journalists that was at that final engagement. And for me, it was kind of my wake up moment for all this entire situation. I think we knew what was going on, but to actually be there as a member of the Royal Family carries out their last working engagement in the Buckingham Palace, which of course was extremely poignant, uh, before she headed back to Canada, it was a very emotional moment. And I remember as many of the guests who were at the engagements uh, left, uh, it was also her chance to say goodbye to some of the loyal staff that have worked with her for some time. And the emotions in the room were very high. And listen, I certainly don't consider myself a friend or even an acquaintance of the couple, but I think you spend that much time around them, you at least become uh, friendly faces around one another, even if very little is actually said. So. Uh, it only felt right to sort of give Megan a goodbye hug. And as she said herself many times, she is a hugger, so. She is a hugger. All right, well, we have to take a quick break, but we'll be talking a lot more with Omid about finding freedom when we return. Welcome back. We're still here with Ovid Scobie, co-author of Finding Freedom, Harry and Meghan and the Making of a Modern Royal Family. Omid, tell us about how the book came about and why this was a story that you wanted to tell. Well, the book had really interesting beginnings because, of course, I had no real plans to ever work on a royal biography. I often feel that they read quite similarly. But there was an interesting story to tell here. I think time and time again, we saw really sort of being uh, sort of there and at the scene on, on many of these engagements and behind the scenes moments with the couple, that many of the things being re reported were very different to what we were seeing uh, sort of in real life or hearing from those close to the couple. And I felt that there was a narrative there that was either being ignored or just wasn't making it onto the pages of some of the British tabloids. And as time went by and we saw some really sort of ugly narratives uh, woven by some of these tabloids, Megan was created into this Duchess difficult character that is a name that stuck by her for a very long time. And that really fed into many sort of racist and sexist tropes we see attached to successful women or successful women of color. And I just felt, again, frustrated by this situation, especially when I was hearing from the people that knew the couple best, that that was just so far from the truth. And so that was really how the book came about. And we started on this book almost two years ago. And so it's been a long time in the making. The one thing we didn't expect, of course, to have the ending that it had today, because originally it was going to follow their courtship, their first year of marriage, and those first days at home with Archie. And that was that. And of course, it was around Archie's birth that we started to realize that behind the scenes, there was a sense of unhappiness from the couple and frustration within the institution of the monarchy, that they wanted to change things or at least be heard on some of their grievances. And as that story developed, it became what we know it is now, you know, the, the moment that saw the couple step away from the family entirely. So it's really been great to capture all of that in one book. And I hope that it gives people a more balanced overview of what it is that actually happened. Yeah, which brings me to my next question. Um, you were working on Finding Freedom before Harry and Meghan's bombshell announcement that they were stepping back from royal duties this past January. Uh, so I'm curious, how does it feel to be the luckiest biographer in the history of Prince? That's what you are. <laughs> and just how far into the book were you when the news broke? 
Well, it, it feels odd to even use the word lucky because, of course, it, it involves a couple that I think went through a really difficult time. But I think what was really important about this and why I'm so glad that it did work out the way in which it did timing wise is that this is a major moment in royal history. We will be looking back at this for some time. How did the institution fail to embrace and make it work with this dynamic woman of colour that had moved over from America and given up everything for this role as the Duchess of Sussex. How did that not work out? And I think that to be able to unpack some of those themes in the book and really get to the bottom of it is something that's very important, not just for now to put some of the tabloid rumours to rest, but also for royal history in the future. It is a gigantic moment in time. Absolutely. Now, so far, the only official response to the book from the Sussexes is that they, quote, were not involved and did not contribute to finding freedom. So can you clarify, did you ask them to do an interview for the book or did you feel it, it was OK without their input? Well, I think this is generally how it works with royal biographies. You will sort of make your intentions known to the palace. And that's exactly what Carolyn and I did. We went to Kensington Palace and told them about our plans to write a biography on Harry and Meghan, and that's sort of where you leave it. You just want to be transparent in what you're working on. But I think we also wanted to have that slight distance from the couple where we were free to independently report on as much as we could. I felt to really give an objective overview of this story, you needed to leave no stone unturned. And we also wanted that ability to speak to sources close to the Cambridges and the Prince of Wales, and even those working for Her Majesty herself. And I think that if you enter that sort of uh, area of cooperative or sort of an authorised biography, of course this is unauthorised, then you sort of are then tied to a particular narrative. And so it worked out very well in that way. And I think that it does paint a very honest portrait of the couple. What I really wanted to do was humanise them in a way, because I felt like we had sort of lost a sense of that over time, that they'd almost become caricatures in the media. And so I hope that when people read this, they see a sense of who they really are. How many people did you both wind up interviewing for the book? Yeah, well, we were very lucky. We spoke to over 100 people, and that includes people in Harry and Meghan's inner circle, their close friends, as well as the people they've worked with in the past and present, and also that wider network, the people they work with in their philanthropic roles, to really get to know them from every aspect. But it was also important to speak to those within the royal households to get a sense of how other members of the royal family felt. Because, of course, this is something that affected everyone. Everyone was involved in this at, at some point. And while it is essentially Harry and Meghan's story, it was important to bring in the voices or the thoughts of other family members as well so we can get a deeper understanding of where some of the fractures in those relationships come from and where we are today with them. Now, after all your research, how would you describe Harry and Meghan's early romance? Is there a passage or story from the book that you think best illustrates their early relationship? I think what I loved about retracing those steps of Harry and Meghan's courtship was, firstly, just how similar they were to each other. I think that despite the fact they're from very different worlds, their hearts are in very similar places. Their grand ambitions to bring change to the world are so similar. And as are their sort of approach to wanting a family, and they were really at just the right place in their lives. It was obviously a very serendipitous first date, and I think that the stars were definitely aligned for that. But my particular favourite moment was really revisiting that second visit to Botswana that they went on. And it was on that trip that we discovered that Harry made the promise to Meghan to make her his wife. And that happened months before the engagement itself. And so while we all thought that that famous roast chicken proposal happened in, in the winter in London, it did actually happen or begin its life in Botswana. And then of course happen with a ring over the roast chicken just days after they got back in mid-August. So they managed to keep that a secret for some time. And it's then fun to look at some of the moments we saw with them beyond that at say the Invictus Games in Toronto, when Meghan wore that husband shirt, she knew she was engaged to Harry. And I think she was playing us all and I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> in Botswana, Harry was pretty impressed with Meghan's camping skills as well, right? <laughs> Yeah, there was a cute moment uh, when we were sort of back reporting that first visit to Botswana, which was really their third date. I think Harry was very impressed by Meghan's ability to rough it. She sort of had a backpack and just a few essentials in it and was quite happy to wipe her face with baby wipes in the morning. And I think for him to see that she wasn't sort of this Hollywood diva uh, that 
potentially could have been the case uh, and in fact see a very down-to-earth woman would have been very pleasantly surprising for him and no bathroom apparently that would have been rough for me <laughs> <laughs> it's tough but they clearly enjoy it out there because they go back and they really love having those visits out there i will imagine that when we're traveling again they'll probably be taking another trip to botswana now ultimately what was it about megan that harry was so drawn to why do you believe that she was the one for him? No doubt he had to know that this wouldn't be the easiest road to go down. He was so obviously shattering the royal mold, if you will, by pursuing a biracial American divorcee, uh, as so many like to point out, and an actress at that. Uh, so what do you think it was about her that he was so immediately smitten by? You've described a lot, but, but what's that one thing you'd say? I think the fact that he was meeting this dynamic, accomplished woman who had already seen a lot of the world and experienced a lot of things, and that was something he was able to connect with, but she also sort of offered a window into the greater world as well. He, of course, grew up in a bubble, and I think he's always tried to get away from that. It's why we saw him really embrace his military roles and continue to want this life outside of the palace bubble. And so I think for Megan, someone with a completely different background, she offered a slightly different perspective on life. And I think we've seen him continue to learn from her all the time. From what I've heard from speaking to friends of Harry, he feels she challenges him. And that's something that he really thrives on. And we look at the man today speaking about systemic racism with civil rights leaders, and he's come a long way. And I think that that really has happened because of his relationship with Megan. Yeah. Now, as far as that bombshell decision to step back, so much has already been written about this. But what would you say is the most surprising thing that you learned about their decision? I think one of the surprising things when unpacking that decision to step back as senior working royals or create that half in, half out working model that they wanted was just how long they had actually been vocal about a desire to create change. I think time and time again, they really tried to have this conversation internally about things needing to change and their relationship with the press being at an all time worse and the impact that was having, not just sort of on their work, but also on their well being as well. And to see that that fell on deaf ears time and time again, and to see where those frustrations were born from really give us a better understanding of why they broke away in the way that they did. I think many people didn't understand the need to do it publicly, to release that website, the Sussex Royal website with the roadmap, almost forcing the Queen into sort of engaging in a conversation about that. And I think when we see what took them to that point, we can understand why they were almost sort of backed into a corner to do it. So fascinating. Now, what do you think it is about Harry that makes him so headstrong or that gives him such courage? There's definitely a pattern here of Harry forging his own way. Would you agree? I think Harry, like many members of the royal family who aren't in the line of, direct line of succession, are forced to go out and find their own way, to create their own path. And I think that that often, as we've seen with other members of the royal family too, when we look at the York girls as well, I think it takes a little longer to sort of find your feet in the world. But once you do, you're really able to carve out your own space. Harry's doing something very unique compared to other members of the royal family, and he's clearly thriving whilst he's doing with it. That stake that he has in the military community and the work that he does with veterans, and of course now being involved in so many different social issues, it shows just what makes him tick. And I think that if he had perhaps had a set role within the institution, his life would have been very different. I mean, his brother has always known he was going to be king. For Harry, he had to go out and find that role for himself, but it's worked out perfectly. Well, let's move to Harry's relationship with William. From what I've read so far, the book paints a truly heartbreaking picture of these once close brothers. William seemingly trying to look out for his kid brother and Harry seemingly resenting him for it. I believe there's a quote in your book that says that there's a thin line between caring and condescending. Am I reading that correctly? And, and how did this get so bad? I think when we look at the fractures in Harry and William's relationship, firstly, we have to remember they are two men in their 30s on very different paths. And so their priorities in life do differ to some extent. But the backstory to that conversation that William had with Harry, which of course saw him sit down and give that advice about moving ahead too quickly, we have to remember that although it may look that Harry's reaction was too sensitive, 
what had happened up until that point was that Harry was very aware of the chatter going on within palace walls about the woman that he had chosen to create a life with. And I think for that reason, and also finding out that friends had been making disparaging comments about Meghan as well, he felt very protected. He was very sure of the woman that he had fallen in love with. And I think he wanted people to respect that rather than question it. You know, there often comes a point in a sort of older and younger brother's lives where you're more equal than you are one sort of more uh, dominant than the other. And I think that William's advice at that time just wasn't requested. And it ultimately did some damage on their relationship moving forward. That said, when we look at where they are today, I think things have moved forward somewhat. Uh, we look at Charles's coronavirus scare and really how things like that can bring a family together. The brothers, for the first time in a while, were speaking again. And whilst we're nowhere near where things used to be, uh, when things were very good between the brothers, there is a sign that things are on their way to a better place. And money was also an issue between the brothers, is that correct? Money's always an issue for all members of the royal family. You are vying for budgets within the firm and often hierarchy plays a great role in that. William as the future king will always come first. Whether he wants to go on a big tour, that will always come first before anything that Harry wants to do. And that makes it very difficult at a time when I would say that or argue that Harry's popularity or the Sussex's popularity was almost usurping that of other members of the royal family. They felt that as a firm or as a business, why not utilize and harness that popularity of the Sussexes and allow them to take on more engagements and to do more projects. But unfortunately, when you have that very traditional system of hierarchy, it doesn't allow for that great movement for those lower down on the ladder. And again, it was one of the many frustrations that the Sussexes had. Do you see Harry and William getting back on the same page, becoming close again? I think things have moved on since where the booklet leaves off. We've seen Harry continue this great relationship that he has with his grandmother. He obviously checked in on her and Prince Philip repeatedly throughout the lockdown period, even wishing her well before she gave that big speech to people in the UK and across the Commonwealth a few months ago. And of course, with Prince Charles going through his own coronavirus battle, that also saw the family brought together in a different way. And I think it really went a long way to repair some of the perhaps uh, bad feelings between Harry and his father and what had happened earlier on in the year. They seem to be in a very good place now from what I hear from sources. And of course, those moments like that bring all family together. And so William and Harry have had conversations since March, since they moved over to the US. And whilst I do think it will take some time before things are truly healed, uh, we know from Harry or from what Harry said to sources that that bond of brotherhood is unbreakable and something that he will always cherish. So I do have hope for them. That's great to hear. Now, as far as Meghan and Kate, the book describes their relationship as one that, quote, struggle to move past distant politeness. Why do you think that is? In your estimation, what's held them back from being closer? I think what was interesting with the Kate and Meghan stories is that time and time again, we saw this narrative emerge from some of the tabloids that these two duchesses were at war that they're essentially in some kind of weird cat fight. And I think that says a lot about some of the sexist traits that we put on women who are successful. And, you know, when we really unpack what that relationship was, I think it was a relationship that was affected by two brothers that were growing distant from each other. I think Meghan and Kate really never had that opportunity to bond in a way that they may have in a different life. Um, I think one of the times that really disappointed Meghan, or at least we know from sources, was going through those difficulties with the press, particularly in her first pregnancy, and not having someone like Kate, who knows exactly what it's like to be a newcomer, reach out and be that shoulder of support for her during what was a very difficult time. And I think moments like that led to disappointment, but as far as I understand, there's no resentment there. There's still respect between the two women. They're just not that close. Now, is there a passage or story from the book you think best illustrates their relationship? Yeah, I think when we look back in the book, there are moments with Kate and Meghan where we do see them having a great time together. Of course, we had those very public moments of the visits to Wimbledon. I think in the very early days, uh, there was a sort of talk about texts going back and forth between the two women. And I think Meghan was very excited about this friendship that could be developing. But 
I think there's a passage in the book that really sums up where we kind of left Kate and Megan's relationship. And it was after talking with someone that was close to Megan, who said that, you know, it is lovely to get flowers for your birthday, but the one thing she would have preferred or appreciated to receive from Kate was a phone call to check in and see how she was during the most difficult moments. And I think the fact that that didn't happen is exactly why this friendship remains at a very surface level now. It wasn't able to enter a place of warmth or depth. That makes sense. Now let's touch on Thomas Markle quickly. What did you learn about Megan's relationship with her father? Uh, and was there anything that particularly surprised you there? Well, I think the story of Megan and her father continues to be extremely saddening and tragic because of course it could have gone so differently. As, as we sort of outline in the book, all the opportunities were there for him to really be protected by the palace and to be shielded from some of the harassment that he was receiving from the press. But I think the biggest disappointment for Meghan was obviously the famous letter, which we've all read about many times over. That response from Thomas, where he goes on to suggest a media photo call between them to sort of show the world that they're in a better place. It really showed how far gone he was in terms of perhaps being corrupted by the media. And I think that that's really where Harry and Meghan do put their blame on this. They feel that the media got to him and that they really changed him for the worse. And unfortunately, we haven't seen much change since then. Thomas continues to be a voice in some of the tabloids, even talking about this book at one point. And it's a shame because I think that he's had so many opportunities to be forgiven and for them to move on. And instead, he holds them back in a very sad and tragic way. Now, as far as we know, Thomas has never met Harry in person. Is that correct? No, Thomas has never met Harry before, but I was told that they did have many phone conversations and that Thomas was very excited to meet Harry. I think there was always talk of them meeting at some point. Of course, being in the community that he is in Mexico, I think there were some security concerns from the palace and why a trip over there wasn't organised immediately in those early days. But of course, the wedding was that big moment for the father-in-law and son-in-law to really bond uh, for a few days before the big day itself. And what a missed moment. And if, you know, as we say in the book, if only he'd got in that car to the airport, things would have been very, very different. Do we know if Thomas attended Meghan's first wedding to Trevor Engelson? He attended the first wedding, so he was there. And it's funny you mentioned that first wedding because I remember so much fuss was made around uh, the likes of Samantha Markle or Meghan's other half siblings uh, sort of speaking out in the tabloids that they hadn't been invited to the Windsor wedding when well, one of the sources we spoke to in this book said that they showed absolutely no interest in Meghan's first wedding and so why should they be at the second one and it shows you really some of the sort of corruption that takes place there when it comes to sort of the media buying interviews of these people just for great headlines and obviously behind the scenes it does cause a lot of hurt. Wow so so how much do you think Meghan's relationship with her father changed once she started dating Harry because it sounds like maybe it wasn't great before and it's certainly not great now is that fair to say? I think when we look throughout the book there are actually moments where we see how close Meghan and her father was I think there are really touching uh, anecdotes throughout the book of the, the one very famous story about Thomas recreating a sort of Barbie doll kit with a uh, uh, dolls of different ethnic backgrounds to represent what her blended or mixed family looked like. And I think that level of thoughtfulness shows us how pure a heart Thomas has. And it's a real shame that he's gone off in this other direction now. Even when Meghan first moved over to Toronto, he helped her move into that place. Uh, he helped do some DIY around the house. And I think that it's moments like that that make it such a shame that that relationship has gone. And I really do think it has gone. I don't think Meghan is looking back anymore. There comes a point in your life when a family member causes that much hurt. It's best to keep a distance. Wow, that is a, a real shame. Any idea how Harry and Meghan feel about the book now that it's out? Historically, they've certainly not been shy about responding to any stories they consider untrue or unfair. So do you take their silence as a good sign? I don't take their silence as anything, to be honest. In fact, there have been some pretty horrendous biographies about Harry and Meghan in the recent months that they also haven't commented on. I don't expect them to even take an interest in something that really goes into some very personal areas of their lives. But 
as members of the royal family, this almost comes with the territory. But what I hope that they would understand with a book like this, the aim is to present a different side of the story, to really offer an insight into where it went wrong, where they were let down by the institution. I think we've heard so much through the pages of some of the British tabloids. And now at least we have a, a more sort of balanced overview of this story and we can finally make some conclusions. Have you heard any reaction from the palace? No official reaction from the palace, but I find it very telling that in the weeks leading up to the launch of this book, there were many sort of anonymous palace quotes in various uh, British newspapers, <laughs> sort of trying to discredit the book or talk about the impact that it may have on the monarchy without, of course, actually knowing what was in it. And I think to me that showed perhaps a fear of the truth coming out. Of course, we do pull back the curtain on some of the inner workings of the institution in a way that others haven't before. But I do think it's important to really look into all of these areas when covering the royal family. It's not all as it seems. So finally, I'm curious, what effect will this book have on your job covering the royals? Is this going to make things easier or harder for you? I think one thing I hear time and time again from royal correspondents, uh, many of which have written negatively about Harry and Meghan, is that it is their job to criticize members of the royal family and to hold them accountable when they feel they've made mistakes. Now, I'm not doing that in this book and that's really not the purpose of this book, but I do think that the bigger picture here is that this is Britain's largest establishment and a very traditional institution that is a great part of our history. And if we don't have a big conversation about how it is that institution failed to keep the first biracial individual that married into it, part of that family and as a working member of the royal family then i'm not doing my job properly absolutely all right i mean such great insight thank you so much for being here and best of luck with the book i'm sure it's going to be a, a massive hit thank you so much the royal report will be right back welcome back it's time now for our social media minutes with our social media correspondent, Gillian Fleischman. Gillian, how are you doing? Hi, Sharon. I'm great. Good to see you. So what do you have for us today? There were such great posts this week. Last Thursday, the Royal Family Instagram posted these images of the East Terrace Garden at Windsor Castle and announced it will be open to the public for the first time in 40 years. The garden was created by George IV in the 1820s. In 1971, Prince Philip redesigned the flower beds and commissioned a bronze lotus fountain based on his own design. Love at the Queen continues to surprise visitors with even more historic things to see. Last Friday, Prince Charles sent his best wishes to the Duchy of Cornwall family on the Clarence House Instagram and noted how heartened he was to hear stories of goodwill around the estate during the pandemic. The post included photos of Prince Charles spending time in the Duchy throughout the years, which spans 130,000 acres, mostly in the southwest of England. It will be passed down to future Dukes of Cornwall, and the Prince has prioritized nurturing and improving the estate for generations to come. Such a touching message from the future king. Last Saturday marked Princess Beatrice's 32nd birthday and we got a bunch of posts in celebration. The royal family page shared this image of the queen with her granddaughter and Princess Eugenie posted two photos honoring her older sister. This one taken on the eve of her wedding last month and an adorable flashback image of them with their mother. It's clear the York sisters have a very special bond. And finally, also this past Saturday, in honor of Princess Anne's 70th birthday later this week, the royal family page kicked off seven days of looking back at the princess's life. Each day leading up to her birthday will spotlight a different decade. Day one, Saturday, celebrated her early years in the 1950s. Sunday spotlighted her teens and the start of her official royal duties in the 1960s. Monday was all about her first royal tour and equestrian achievements in the 1970s. And Tuesday was all about the 1980s. Can't wait to see what else we learn about the Princess Royal in the coming days. And that's your Social Media Minute. Now, Gillian, I, I think I saw somewhere that East Terrace Garden isn't the only new place visitors can explore on the grounds of Windsor Castle. Is that right? Yes. The Moat Garden, which is beneath the iconic round tower, will now also be open a couple days during the week for visitors. It's thought to have been created during the reign of Edward III, and it's believed that Geoffrey Chaucer used it as the setting for The Knight's Tale, which is the first story from the Canterbury Tales. So you know it's a must see. Looks beautiful. Great stuff today, Gillian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. All right, Royal Watchers, that's our show for today. Remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the latest episodes of the Royal Report streaming every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. 
I'm Sharon Carpenter. Stay safe, keep calm, and carry on.